Hey everyone, this is Andrew Kisson, Director of Marketing with Zon Dental. We're here with Graham Turner and Corey Lambertson from Asiga. Guys, how are you? Good morning, Graham. Thanks for joining us at 6 a.m. Uh, in Australian time. No problem. We are very excited to introduce and launch the new printers from Asiga here for Zon Dental in the U.S. We have the, the Pro 4K and the Asiga Max coming to market here. Can one of you guys give us a little bit of an overview on which printer for which indication and just a little bit of a overview of the printers? I, I mean, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the printers are completely versatile, both of them in the fact that they can both print the same range of resins and indications. And so it's, it's a, they're both like universal tools you can look at from the dental industry. And so the Sega Max and the Pro 4K, the Pro 4K is essentially just the, the younger, uh, bigger brother of the Sega Max. And so they, they both house the, the same technologies. Uh, it's just that the, uh, the Pro 4K is just a, a larger format printer itself. Um, I'm sure Graham is probably dying to, to get into more of the specifics. Graham, I'll let you take over from here. Oh, you've covered it pretty well, but the I think the the Max UV is predominantly a desktop system. Um, so we 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 sort of pitch that towards the low to medium volume production output. Um, it's a really compact system. It's probably one of the smallest footprint systems on the market, but it really does pack a punch in that it does it does produce a good um, really usable volume of parts. And then, yeah, as Corey said, the, the Pro 4K is its, is its larger counterpart. Um, it's got a build plate size three times larger, using all the same technology that's well proven in the Max UV. Um, so we've got really good stability across both systems. But that's the Pro 4K being a, a much larger floor standing unit. In your experience and what you're seeing from dental laboratories, what does the build plate, you know, the size and the output, what does that equate to in terms of a lab's workflow and, and why should a lab really care and do the do, due diligence of one size versus another, whether it's an Asiga printer or another printer on the market? I think it depends on where they're at, uh, you know, from a from a growth standpoint and where they're, they're specifically at in the, in the realm of digital dentistry. And so if they're, if they're just, you know, making their strides and entering into digital dentistry, I think the Asiga max is a great option um, because that, I mean, that, that facility is probably going to be that smaller to medium lab itself. Uh, and then if it's a, uh, a laboratory that's in that higher production scale, that's where the pro 4k is going to fit in perfect um, itself. And, there's even some users that almost even prefer instead of having just like a single Pro 4K, they'll buy two or three Asiga Maxes instead, which opens up the ability to print uh, different materials at the same time as well. And so, uh, you know, there's a couple of different directions you can head with with these printers. Uh, in dental and dental technology, specifically dental laboratory. Everyone is always talking about open technology, open architecture, you know, being able to play with others. And the Asiga printer kind of fits or the printers fit that bill. Why, why is open technology so important to dental laboratories and, and how has Asiga kind of addressed that? So I think um, it's important to go back a few years. We started... Um, so we launched our first printers in 2011. Um, in 2013, that's when we started working with biocompatible materials, predominantly in the audio sector, so manufacturing hearing aids. And that's how they've been manufactured, custom hearing aids for the past 30 years. Um, the, the development of materials since then has just been mind-blowing, really. Um, the dental sector really came on board with 3D printing in 2017. That's when the, the that's when the industry turned the corner with that technology, and ever since then the mark the materials are flooding the market really because the material will unlock an application. So um, being open and the power of ha having a truly open system like our our printers are compatible with over four hundred and fifty um, market leading materials today. 
and that's growing weekly. It's it's phenomenal at the speed and the rate at which that's growing. Um, but there's no one material manufacturer that's going to have it all. You know, they may have a good material for a denture, for example. Um, another mat- uh, another material manufacturer may have a, a good material for a splint. One's best for models. One's best for surgical guides. Have being open just gives you that flexibility to you know use the best materials on the market at the, on that day. You know, so it's a the power of open is yeah is it is really there when you look at the the development of the materials. Your yeah, your technology. So, sorry, go ahead, Corey. I was just gonna I was just gonna add. Um, I don't know who who said it, whether it was Graham or another colleague at, at Asiga, but the uh, you know who are we to determine what our customers uh, should be using? You know, it's uh, how do we know what's best for our customer in, in every inner instance and. Uh, you know, we have to remember the ultimate goal here is that we provide our patients with the with the best service and best restorative health as we possibly can. Um, how can one 3D printer company determine what's best for them? And by being open, we give the end user the ability to make that decision itself. And so they can they can uh, actually go through proper treatment planning without any sort of boundaries or restrictions from a material standpoint. Mm. Your, your technology is almost future proof, right? You know, if, uh, if a new resin comes out tomorrow, uh, your, you team validate, uh, I assume, right? Validate it and can, can print it. So you're, you're essentially, uh, Corey, to your point, giving the customers what their best solution is, uh, without having to invest in a new piece of equipment. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, uh, we don't know what the future is going to hold and the, the chemistries keep changing and, as it keeps advancing throughout the years, we're, we're hoping that uh, a SIGO will be able to help the material manufacturers put their best foot forward and, and uh, be able to have somebody that they can lean on uh, as they're developing. When we talk about DLP versus SLA and all the different types of technology, something that stood out to me about the Asiga technology is the SPS technology. Can one of you maybe give us a a rundown or your explanation of what that does and, and why a dental laboratory should should care. Yeah, so the the uh, the Asiga is actually and I, I say this to Graham and he probably laughs at me, but I honestly think that Asiga that we produce the most intelligent 3D printer on the market. And uh, the reason I agree with you, Corey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do agree with <laughs> it's it's uh in the the reason why is because we uh, we developed monitoring technologies that no other 3D printer has that allows us to to monitor every aspect of the layering process of 3D printing to ensure that we have the most accurate structures possible. And so the SPS, what it, what it stands for is the smart positioning system. And if we look at a 3D printer itself and how 3D printing works, just from a general sense, the uh, especially a photopolymer based 3D printer, uh, there's a resin vat and a build plate and uh, let me get in camera. So when the build plate moves down into the resin vat, there's a, a high opposing force that is created from the viscosity of resin. And so what will happen if we can't detect those pressures, the printers will actually get a, a deflection in a cantilever effect itself. And so this happens on many 3D printers that are on the market that don't have this type of monitoring technology. And so what we'll see with the SPS is that when the build plate moves down to the resin vat, there's these pressure sensors that detect that positive pressure. And it allows the printer to actually reach its true layer thickness. Remember, if with 3D printing, we're starting at a foundation point. And so we want to make sure that every layer starting at the very first layer is the true layer thickness, creating the most accurate structure. And so that the smart positioning system detects that pressure make sure that the printer reaches the proper exact layer thickness, then exposes the light, curing the layer. It then will separate from the resin vat and reapproach and do the process over, over and over and over again until the object is completely printed. Now, it sounds like it's going to take a long, you know, long period of time because it's waiting for the sensors to detect a pressure and detect when it's relieved. And uh, it happens in milliseconds and but it is enough to make a difference between an extremely accurate print versus a uh, poorly uh, printed object Graham, do you sign off on that or is there anything else you want to add to uh to that technology 
Yeah, um, I think that, yeah, that's a great, uh, great explanation. Um, thanks, Corey. The, um, the, the SPS technology basically works off an absolute build platform position. So we're working off an actual platform position, not an estimated platform position, which every other printer on the market does today. So as we drive down the Z axis, we don't just drive to a position on the Z, we detect the actual deflection on the printer and the material flow. And we only expose that layer once that platform is in its actual position. So just to add to Corey's description, that's maybe another way to look at it, but Corey did a, a much better job than I did. Um, but yeah, it's important because if you don't know where your build platform is during that layering process, and we all know that 3D printers produce parts layer by layer, the build platform positioning is critical to um, f for part dimensional accuracy um, yeah. and consistency. We've also we've got we've also got to remember that we're not just 3D printing a part. We're we're Sega have always manufactured manufactured 3D printers for production applications. So consistency is critical It's as critical as dimensional accuracy and um, so i think we pride ourselves and the sega sps technology is is that technology that just provides that level of production consistency and repeatability when, when i hear 3d printing and, and technology that's either here or coming you know the the buzzwords are uh, consistency accuracy speed mm. And and the variety of indications. Are we at a tipping point where you know most printers are accurate enough, or or do you feel strongly that you know the technology behind a Sega is what separates you from some of the other printers on the market? And we're not at that tipping point. You know, I'm not a technician, so I so I don't know. But you know, is it these tech these printers are accurate enough, or is there still a ways to go? And um, printers are different in the market in the dental market today. Well, I think Corey touched on earlier and said that I'd laugh at the um, the point of a Sega believing that we make the most intelligent 3D printer on the market. We genuinely do. Um, I think 3D printing, the, um, 3D printers in general, um, they may be good at some applications. They may be good um, when they're printing well, but it's achieving that consistency. You know, 3D printing, it, is used in many manufacturing applications today. Um, and there's really a, not every 3D printer is capable to be a production system. Um, it's capable, I think every 3D printer is capable of printing apart accurately, but doing that consistently is a challenge. It really is difficult. It's a, it's a challenge that we believe we've overcome. You know, with our SPS technology, we have an internal radiometer as well that detects actual LED power. And then we've, you know, we project high resolution images. So there's a, those combined produce a, um, that's a good basis for producing an accurate print. Um, but there's lots of, there are lots of components that go into that. So even the materials play a role. Um, but we genuinely believe that, I think if, um, I remember going back to a presentation that our managing director gave um, years ago, and he touched on the fact that, the, that as a human as a human race, we've put a man on the moon. You know, we split the atom. You, we've made all these great advances in technology um, and achievements, but we've always struggled to. And you can talk to anybody who has had a three D printer, spent a lot of money on three D printing over the years. They've had a hit and miss scenario with them. Um, you know, 3D printing, for it to be, to have its place in manufacturing, it needs to compete against, say, an injection molding machine or something that is used to manufacture your computer monitor, your webcam casing, your car bumper, you know, your car steering wheel, all of those components. Um, and it needs to be able to produce parts consistently, just like the traditional manufacturing methods that are used today or have been used for you know for for years and years so yes 3d printing um with the right focus on what a 3d printer is actually intended to do can be a um a really attractive production tool um and we we genuinely do believe that we have achieved that with our systems 
Yeah, and something that I've I've realized, you know, with with being at a Sega, it's uh, we don't stop at just good enough. And so I think there's a lot of printers on the market that, you know, they they may stop at good enough and or good enough for the industry or good enough for the indication. It's um, even on the material science aspect. Um, you know, once again, you know, rounding back to the quality of life for our patients and the people that we're trying to serve with these uh, pieces of equipment and resins, you can't stop there. And so you have to, we have to give 110% of everything we do. And, and we do that with our printers uh, and materials. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned quality of life for, for patients and you know, what better example or, or product category than digital dentures? And, you know, we're certainly at a point in the dental lab industry where it seems that Crown & Bridge labs are so comfortable with uh, CAD CAM that they're starting to kind of explore and get into the removable market. Analog removable labs are starting to figure out, hey, maybe there's a better way to, to do this without, um, you know, some of the, the more analog or manual ways to do this. Why do you think... Um, that dental laboratories are making that transition into digital dentures and how could they be successful with using the Asigo printer and some of the indications from the materials that are validated uh, with your technology? Look, I think the, the most exciting aspect on digital dentures is the fact that you can, you can produce a digital denture in, in, in half the visits uh, that it would normally take for a traditionally processed denture. And the, the other aspect of that is the cost is significantly less um, and they're extremely accurate and extremely precise, especially with the, you know, modern uh, CAD softwares that you can develop them then and design them in. Uh, and then when you pair it with a, a performance machine like the Asiga, the output is just outstanding. Uh, but if we look at it from, from the quality of life, I mean, and I use this example quite often, but uh, when we look at nursing home uh, patients, for example, they're their life expectancy on average in a nursing home is six months. You know, it, it's that's end of life and it's kind of sad, but imagine being in that position where you can't have a proper fitting denture and imagine where a denture could actually change that person's person's quality of life for the last six months, if not longer and prolong their life. And so um, I know that's a very uh, drastic measure, but it's, it's powerful in the aspect that it can change people's lives by being able to 3D print a denture. Uh, I mean, change them. I mean, a 180 degree turnaround. Uh, well, guys, I really appreciate the time. Uh, Graham, appreciate you joining us so early in the morning. Look forward to seeing what comes out of Asiga next. And uh, as we kind of shift, hopefully out of the pandemic here coming, uh, coming soon, look forward to getting to meet you guys in person. Yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to yeah seeing you, seeing you over stateside sometime soon thank Great. you andrew i appreciate it